Grimes. When death and murder become an everyday occurrence, it is generally labeled war. When brother kills brother on the battlefield, it is the most pyrrhic of victories. Nobody wins, everyone loses. And it is in such times that cowards and heroes abound. We will meet both today, and knaves and cheats, and some American history we're not too proud of. Willie, get me out of here. I can't face that man. He betrayed 1,500 of us. His orders killed us. You've got to face him, Calvin. What are you running away from? Here you accuse the general of a despicable act, of sacrificing 1,500 of our own men without a thought. Cal, you hold the rank of major in the Union Army. Talk to your former commanding officer. Tell him to his face what you think of him and why. Your ghost has come back from Andersonville and orders you to speak up. <laughs> Our drama, The Ghost of Andersonville, was adapted from an actual account of the Civil War, especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Tony Roberts. I'll be back shortly with Act One. It is the last year of the Civil War. The Confederacy is about to collapse. Re-elected Abraham Lincoln is loved and hated. And Washington bigwigs are looking towards who will be the next president. They are looking to someone from the army, perhaps a general. For that they need heroes. Not always easy to come by. General Cutler, have you heard the latest? Can't say I have, my boy. But you men with the Secret Service, you seem to know all the Washington scuttlebutt. I was in Bill Wood's office. We were getting our assignments. Uh, so many for counterfeit detection, so many detailed to protect Lincoln and Stanton and so on. And then Wood said, they tell me Cutler's the man. I'm the man for what? The party is picking you to follow Lincoln. That's the thinking. The thinking of nominating me when Lincoln's term runs out? Well, that's the talk. Well, what makes them think Lincoln won't ask for a third term? He might. Then again, he might not. Well, who would I be running against? Grant. Grant? Oh, I wouldn't stand much of a chance. He's got command of all the Union armies. General, I think the people would prefer a Cutler in the White House and a Grant in the barracks. Nicely said, Forrest. But do the people even know who I am? Word will get around. You've already earned your stars, sir. No one has forgotten Fredericksburg or your gallant attack on Chattanooga, sir. Well, that was some time ago. And that you are the acknowledged hero of the prisoner exchange plan. It's not only who wins the war and pray the Lord Grant will defeat the rebels, but it's who looks after our boys. Kim, if you put it that way, I'd say I might have a chance. I hope when Bill Wood was making these Secret Service assignments, he intended to keep you at my side. You have given me... Excellent protection since I came out of the hospital. And it appears you have a political mind as well. I'd like to know I can count on you. An honor, General Cutler. I hope to continue to serve you. Timothy, I think I'll ride down to Burnside and surprise Mrs. Cutler with the news. <laughs> Benjamin, that is the most exciting thing I have ever heard. You should be very proud. Well, I am a little pleased. However, we're a considerable distance from the White House. If the election were held tomorrow, I'm afraid most voters would say, Benjamin Cutler who? I shall have to drum up some ideas to bring me to the attention of the public. What about that prisoner of war who's leaving Richmond for Washington? What about him? Isn't he the last prisoner of war to be returned to us from Andersonville? 
Yes, but I don't see what... Doesn't it occur to you that this could be a story that would make all of America sit up and take notice? I don't quite see how. If we arrange to have all the newspapers here the day the prisoner arrives... Now? Now do you see? You mean... I welcome him here at Burnside. Benjamin, it is you who have organized the exchange of prisoners. Those rebels we hold here for our brave Union men in Andersonville. Finally, the last prisoner returns home. If you welcome that man, bring him into our home, you become a symbol of the kind of leadership we all look to. Mary, I like that. I like that. <laughs> well, I'd better get cracking on the idea. I'll talk it over with Tim Forrest. Oh, I'm glad he's still assigned to you. He's so faithful. And quite clever. He's just the one to make the high-level arrangements with Stanton. Stanton? The Secretary of War. He can fix it up to have the man welcomed here in our own home. I wonder if he could get the army band to play on the law. Oh, I can just see it. Major, uh, what's his name? Calvin Russell. Major Russell arrives on the noon train. He's probably accompanied by Red Cross nurses. Is he married? Oh, no, no, he's not. Oh, good. You and I are at the station. We whisk him in our carriage here to Burnside. The band strikes up the star-spangled banner. Reporters from newspapers all over the world are here. Oh, Benjamin, can't you just see it? You must make a marvelous welcoming speech. You might even have some photographs taken. Oh, it's going to be so exciting. The event of the century. <laughs> Please, folks, all you reporters, please don't crowd the observation platform of the train. Kim, when's he coming out? The train's been here for ten minutes. Where is he? General, you know the Major's lame. I don't know which car he's in. It'll take him a little time to get out here. I mean, there's such a thing as a schedule. Here we've got a carriage waiting and an army of reporters and photographers hanging around at home on the lawn. That Calvin Russell was always unreliable. Oh, I didn't know you knew the Major personally. He was in my outfit, got captured in the Chattanooga raid, and shipped off to Andersonville. Oh, Forrest, send word back into the coach. I want the Major out here in three minutes, not one second more. Yes, sir. I'm not going out there. Major Russell, everyone has come a very long way to welcome you home. You are taking this ceremony all the wrong way. Am I? Now, what about your friends? You must have friends out there in the station. Some of my friends drowned in the Mississippi. Those who didn't swam with me to shore and were shot as they swam. The rest, the few who escaped, died in the prison at Andersonville. Nurse Wilson, today I'm alone. I have no friends left. Well, I guess I was wrong, Major. I thought you agreed to be greeted by General Cutler because you wanted to honor all the men who died during the war and wanted to speak for them. But I guess I was mistaken. Well, I... Maybe I hadn't thought of that. Now, there's going to be a reception. Secretary of War Stanton himself is supposed to be there. They'll want you to speak. Do you suppose I could meet President Lincoln? Of course you can, and you will, I'm sure. General Cutler has it all arranged. Cutler, that... That what? Never mind. Is he still out there? I'm sure he is. He arranged all this for you, Major. Nurse Wilson, you go out to the observation platform and you tell whoever's in charge... That if Cutler will go away, I'll come out. I don't want to be in the same state as that man. Uh, go, go see who that is, will you? I don't want anyone to come into this compartment. I'll duck into the laboratory. Go on. Yes? Oh, nurse. I'm Tim Forrest, Secret Service. General Cutler asked me when the Major would be making an appearance. Now, we're a little late and a little tight on the schedule. Is he all right? Oh, yes, he's fine. Uh, Tell everyone he'll be out directly. Oh, thank you, nurse. I heard all of that. Why didn't you tell him? Go on, you go on out there and tell him what I told you. Cutler leaves, 
Russell arrives. Won't you change your mind? I don't wish to have anything to do with the general. He can stay if he wants to, but I'll not see him. Hand me my crutch, please. I'll be waiting right here when you come back. Major, they won't understand. No one has any idea that That's you... exactly it. No one has any idea what kind of a man he is. But I know. And the dead know. I haven't been in a hell on earth all these months to be welcomed by a man who doesn't deserve his stars. I hate him. I saw him from the window, alive and fat. Well, I'll do what I can. I cannot tell them what you want me to. I'll have to think of something else. General, some of us have been waiting since six this morning. Do you know for a fact that the Major is on the train? Yes, of course I know it for a fact. The man could be ill. Anything. Uh, General Cutler, may I talk to you? Forrest, this is ridiculous. Fifteen minutes we've been waiting. What is it? Is Russell sick? Why the delay? I look like an idiot standing up here on the observation platform all by myself trying to answer reporters. Uh, there appears to be a slight problem. So what is it? His nurse is on the way out and she wants to tell you herself. What is all the mystery? Is General Cutler here. I'd like a word with him. What is it, nurse? Where's the major? I'm General Cutler. Is he coming out soon? I'm afraid not. Uh, the major sent his regrets, but he is a little shy, I'm afraid. Shy? All we want him to do is come out here, shake my hand, and we take a few pictures. I make a speech, and we whisk him off to my farm. General, what happened was, as soon as the train pulled into the platform, he... Well, he started getting very nervous. You do understand. He's been a prisoner for well over two years. Almost everyone he knew died in prison. What's your name? Nurse Wilson. Nurse Wilson? You go back to him on the double. Tell the Major we honor him and wait for him to make an appearance. Tell him I personally am waiting for him. It won't make any difference, General. No difference? Does he know I'm here? Yes, he's been watching you from the window. You mean he can see me now? He just said to send his regrets, but right now he doesn't feel like leaving the train. General, may I see what I can do? Please give me a moment. Nurse Wilson, if you'd lead the way, I'll have a talk with the Major. General Cutler, allow me to place the Major by your side. Calvin Russell. <laughs> good to see you. So good, my old buddy. I have to make a speech first. Uh, Forrest, uh, will you make an introduction, please? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, gentlemen of the press, guests, General Benjamin Cutler would like to say a few words to welcome Major Calvin Russell the last of the Union prisoners to be released from Andersonville. <clears throat> Major Russell, gentlemen of the Fourth Estate, citizens of this great country, from Pennsylvania Avenue to the length and breadth of this vast great country, our hearts go out to the men who so gallantly fought and gave their lives so that this nation under God... That is why we are honored to welcome from the bottom of our grateful hearts this hero of heroes, Major Kelvin Russell. May we have a picture of you, General Cutler, uh, shaking hands with the Major? Excuse me, uh, Nurse Wilson. Will you take me back to my compartment, please? But the picture, uh, what is this? Forrest, Forrest, do something. He turned his back on me and walked out. Forrest, do something. Not a very auspicious beginning to a ceremony 
which General Cutler hoped would solidify his political career. What is it that makes Major Russell turn away from his old commander in the field? At this point, one can only guess it is of such magnitude that the former prisoner of war risks a reprimand or even a court-martial. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Washington at the end of the Civil War. General Benjamin Cutler seeks a political opportunity which might make his name better known. To further that desire, he has arranged for the last prisoner of war to be released from the infamous Andersonville prison and arrive for a ceremonial welcome. Only the Major isn't buying. He will not cooperate. Have they left the railroad station yet, Nurse Wilson? They are leaving now. Major, what are you going to do? Sit here in the compartment until the whole party is gone? The only person I don't wish to lay eyes on is Cutler. When he goes, I'll come out. But there is a reception planned at his house. The Secret Service agent told me the Secretary of War plans to be there. Now, you're not going to insult him, are you? Mm -hmm. You think there's something wrong with me, don't you? One doesn't have to be very clever to realize something happened between you two during the war and that you haven't forgiven him. No, I haven't. Major Russell, the general has left. May I say a word to you? Shall I leave? No, of course not. Come in, Forrest. I guess uh, I owe you an explanation. You don't owe it to me. Well, I don't know Cutler or anything either. What are we going to do now? Mrs. Cutler is at their home and everything is laid on. A message will be read to you from President Lincoln. Even the Marine Band is there. I don't mind all that. It's Cutler himself. Well, then you're in luck. The general had to return to the capital. Everything ran so late, he won't be going with you to his farm. Well, I'll go to the reception. I'll meet his wife, sure. Anything, so long as I don't have to shake his hand or talk to him. Major, it's all in your honor. Everyone who is here today honors you. I'm sorry my husband had to go back to Washington, but he has a great deal to attend to. We uh, saw each other on the platform of the last car of the train. I wonder if I could speak to you for a moment. Oh, certainly, Timothy. Uh, Major, will you excuse us? I shall be right back and give you a first-hand tour of our little farm. Don't let any of the reporters intimidate you. Well, that's all right, Mrs. Cutler. I, I won't. Mrs. Cutler, we have a problem with the Major. I didn't have time to explain to you why we arrived from the railroad station so late, but he refused to come out on the observation platform for the General's welcome. Refused? He finally did. It took a lot of persuading. There's been some experience the Major and the General shared at Chattanooga, and the Major still holds some kind of a grudge. Could you, Mrs. Cutler, somehow get the Major to agree to talk to the reporters, at least to one of them? Well, of course he will. I'll make him. After all, the whole purpose of having him arrive here in the first place is so that we could generate some publicity to help the General's political image. Now, if we could only get the Major to acknowledge his indebtedness and all of those freed from Andersonville, indebted to the general. Well, you can imagine how the public would react. You are talking to the one person who could not agree with you more, Timothy. Well, here we are back. Mr. Forrest, I think that's a wonderful idea, and I suggest you pick up whoever you think will do the best job and have them down by the lily pond. I'll do that. Thank you very much. Now, yeah, Major, did my husband tell you of his infatuation with growing water lilies? No, ma'am. No, we never got round to talking about that. Uh, he's mad for them. You wouldn't think so, a big burly soldier like him. And now we shall tour Burnside. We named our farm after the Major General himself. Oh. Well, he'd be pleased, ma'am. Yes, over a thousand acres of good farming land. 
Well, he'd like that. I want to show you the lily pond. It's uh, quite a little distance down this path. You don't mind that? Uh, walking with the cane, I mean. Mrs. Cutler, with this cane, I've walked to Hades and back. And I intend to keep on walking. I would like to see all the sights on the general's farm. You just show me the way. I'll follow. There it is. Ma, isn't that the most beautiful lily pond you ever saw? They're not all water lilies, you know. That one's a floating heart. And all around the edge, those big leaves, elephant ears. And there's a water hyacinth. Uh, Mrs. Cutler, uh, may I introduce myself? Wilbur May of the New York Weekly News. Well, how do you do? Uh, Tim Forrest said the uh, major might be ready to be interviewed. I think so. I hope you agree, Major Russell. You know, there are 150 reporters from up north covering the war, and for me to get first crack at interviewing Calvin is a great piece of luck. Right, Cal? You and the Major know one another? Well, Calvin and I are cousins. We're uh, real proud of you at home, Cal. Well, that's splendid. I think I can safely leave you two alone. Oh, uh, there's only one thing I'll ask of you, Mr. May, and that is... I'd like your readers to know it was General Benjamin Cutler who was responsible for getting so many of our boys out of Andersonville. Uh, certainly. I hope it all goes well. Well, uh, how do you feel, Cal? Did you hear what she said about Cussed Cutler getting our men out of Andersonville? Uh-huh. Mm. And if it weren't for him, there wouldn't have been so many Union boys in Andersonville. Oh, is that so? Well, this is some celebration I got going for you. No, it don't fool me, Willie. Cutler never did anything for anyone but himself. Huh. If it, if it hadn't have been for Cutler, we'd never have been in that prison. We were betrayed. That's the real story. Betrayed by who? Will you print it if I tell you? <laughs> now, come on. What a question to ask. An exclusive with a top-ranking former prisoner of war? Why wouldn't I? Now, for one thing, it knocks the stuffing out of your big Washington hero. General Cutler? Hmm. Take the load off your feet, Willie, and thank the Lord you got the use of both of them. You know I have to go into a hospital for a wooden leg? Yeah, I'm very sorry about that. Were you tortured at Andersonville? Yes, but that's not how I lost my leg. I'll tell you how. Where do you want me to begin? Well, Cal, it was your war. You tell it. It was November, back in 63. Longstreet had pushed us with our backs to Chattanooga. Bragg did nothing. He just sat there, thinking he could starve out the rebels. We were upriver. And uh, then Cutler got the bright idea to build rafts and float the troops past the enemy and gain a foothold on the southern bank. Williams, how many rafts are ready now? Only enough for about 500 troops, sir. Why are they so slow? I've got to move 2,500 men before dawn. The men are doing the best they can, sir. Russell, Colonel Russell. Has anyone seen Major Russell? General Cutler, yes, sir. What is it, General? Williams tells me the rafts won't be finished before tomorrow night. So we wait. I'm sure Williams could supply enough rafts tonight for 1,000 troops. What are you thinking? Well, we send two contingents. One tonight of 1,000 men and one tomorrow of 1,500. If the 1,000 men get through tonight, the Johnny Rebs on Lookout Mountain aren't going to be caught napping tomorrow night. <laughs> Up there on Lookout Mountain. <sighs> Tomorrow, that'll be your responsibility, Cal. With the 1,500 men? I have every confidence you'll make it. Floating downstream, armed with just our rifles. They'll be waiting for us, and they'll cut us into small pieces. Major, it's an order. And that's just what the rebels did. We never got as far as the southern bank. Of the 1,500 with me on the chained rafts, a 1,000 were blown out of the water. 
500 were shot as they tried to swim to shore, and the rest of us were rounded up and taken to Andersonville. It was in that action that my leg got shut up. Well, that's never been told. Well, there's only one man to blame, Will, and that's Cutler. He was responsible. When you're locked up and you see 500 men dying of scurvy, no food worth eating, mush for days, weeks, months... I understood it was pretty fierce. You don't know the half of it, Will. My men, the best men in the world, dead and dying all around me. Because one man gives an order against all common logic and common sense, he orders 1,500 floating sitting ducks to their death. Yeah, I... I can't tell you how horrified and sorry I am. Sending men down to Mississippi like that in two groups may have been a tactical error. It, it happens in war, Cal. But it shouldn't. I told him not to. We had one chance to make it, not two. Sure, the first rafts got through, but the next night they were waiting for us. But do you hold Cutler responsible for conditions in Andersonville? I do. For those who died there because of him, you bet I do. And he has the nerve, the gall, to ask me to be his standard bearer for his political career. I almost exploded when I heard that. All right. I'll write it, Cal. Is there any more you'd like to add? Just more of the same, Willie. Betrayal and hell. I don't like to interrupt you, gentlemen, but I've wonderful news. Uh, Mrs. Cutler, uh... The Major has given me all I need. The General has returned. He's here. Isn't that marvelous? Mr. Forrest is just bringing him down. I'm going up the path to meet them. Willie, get me out of here. What am I going to do? You are going to face him, Calvin. What are you running away from? Here you are, accusing the General of a despicable act. Of sacrificing needlessly 1,500 of our own men without a thought. Only you are telling me. Cal. You're a major in the Union Army. Talk to the general. Tell him to his face what you think of him and why. Your ghost has come back from Andersonville and orders you to speak up. Here I am again, Major. <laughs> Sorry I had to get off to the capital of our great nation, but business before pleasure any time. Uh, Benjamin, this is Mr. Wilbur May. He's with the New York Weekly News. Oh, an excellent newspaper. I'd be glad to make a statement. Uh, no, Benjamin, not now. You two men will feel more at ease if I take Mr. May off with me. Uh, please, sir, do come along. All right. We'll leave you both alone. Mr. May, may I take your arm? Willie, I'll talk to you later. Calvin, I'm sorry. The way it turned out. Deeply sorry. You scum. You never once admitted you gave that order that killed so many of us. Admitted it? How? How? Publicly. I knew you didn't. I had a nurse who came down especially from Washington. She didn't know a thing about Chattanooga. Said no one did. It was unforgivable. I've never forgiven myself either, Calvin. But that was two years ago. Why bring it up now? I see them all floating down the Mississippi that night. Fifteen hundred of us. And the gunfire and the screaming... Have you ever heard hundreds of men screaming in agony at the same time? Hundreds diving and falling into the water. Hundreds more gasping and drowning. The river red with their blood. All dead. All but a handful. And myself ending up to die by inches in Andersonville. Because cursed Cutler railroaded us to that death. Don't tell me you had no way of knowing. You were the general. I was only a major. I warned you what would happen. Calvin, you're getting yourself all hit up. Did you honestly think I would come out of a rebel prison to praise you so that you could hold some political office? Suppose you got elected. What would you do under fire to the American people? Sell them down the river to die? What do you want me to do? I'm sorry. I told you how sorry I was. I have nightmares about it still. But life must go on. Why must it go on, Ben? Why must it go on for you? What, uh, what are you going to do with that gun? Not for you, life won't go on. Join the others who died in the river and in prison. <laughs> 
A gun is fired. Its sound echoes not only across the general's farm near Washington, but across the entire country. The bullet misses its mark. It grazes but does not wound the general. But there is a gaping wound in his reputation which will never heal. I shall return shortly with Act Three. It's not easy to arrest a war hero for attempted murder, and General Cutler won't permit it. In the scuffle, he pockets the Major's gun and quickly retires to his room. Secret Service agent Timothy Forrest tries to spread the story that what happened was an accident, a service revolver discharging unintentionally. But fear is in the air, and the night is churned by thunder, lightning, and rain. Then... It is morning. Is that you, Forrest? Uh, Tim Forrest? Wilbur. Oh, I'm not too pleased to see you. Have you seen the general? He grabbed that gun of Cal Russell so fast and disappeared, I, I haven't had a chance to get his side of the story. What they said to each other, how it happened, you know. Oh, I told you it went off accidentally. Tim, I didn't believe that. Have you seen General Cutler? Well, Mrs. Cutler said he may be walking the ground. He isn't. I've searched every inch of the place, up at five to do it. I want to get to the general before every other reporter in the country shows up. Now, you know where he is. That's your job. Are you sure he's not out there? A thousand acres? He'll show up. Tim, I've got a press deadline. Why don't we try his room, just, just in case? Well, I suppose he could have returned and gone upstairs a back way so he wouldn't be seen. Hiding from the press. All right, I'll follow you. Uh, no, 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 I can find it alone. Uh, no, you don't. If you interview the general... I am going to be there. General? General Cutler? You think he went back to bed? General Cutler, are you in there? Well, try the door. It's unlocked. Hey, let's go in. Well, there he is, with his back to us, sitting at his desk. General, I'm sorry to disturb you. I hope you don't mind my barging in like this, but... Wilbur May here wanted to get a statement. Good Lord. He's fainted. He fell forward. Forrest. What's the matter? Oh, it's his blood. Look on the desk. He's, oh. he's been shot. He just keeled over. Oh, Lord in heaven. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll get no, someone. No, no, it's too late. He's dead. The general's dead. How can that be? He's been dead a couple of hours. Sitting like that with a bullet hole in his head. Uh, leaning back in his armchair and then falling onto his desk. Forrest, uh... Forrest, I, I have to write this. All of it. Those powder burns on his temple. He's been shot at close range. Very close. Mm, someone he knew. Someone he let come right up to him. Tim, maybe it wasn't murder. Maybe it was suicide. A shame, you know, what the Major accused him of. No, 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 it couldn't have been suicide. Well, what are you looking for? For the two missing things that might... Might, I said, make me think suicide. But they're not here. Two things are missing? But do you see a farewell note? Any note? A word to his wife? A written explanation why he killed himself? And the other missing item... Even more important, if the general shot himself, where's the gun? You're right. Where's the gun? It was murder, and the murderer took it with him. I'll bet a year's wages when they examine the bullet, they'll find it was fired from the major's gun. What are you going to do about Cal Russell? What can I do but place him under arrest? He's the prime suspect. I don't look forward to the next two steps. Oh? What's that? Placing the Major under arrest, and then finding Mrs. Cutler and breaking the terrible news to her. A 
But I didn't kill him. Major, you'll have to do more than merely say so. A great many witnesses saw you take the shot at him. Yes, that was yesterday. I know that I must have been out of my mind to do it. I know that. To hate a man is one thing, but to be a judge, jury, and executioner is another. Besides, uh, you say there's no gun. Yes, that's a consideration at this moment, but whoever shot the general could have thrown the gun in any of a hundred places. But it will be found. And make no mistake about that. Hasn't it occurred to the Secret Service, Mr. Forrest, that since I was sleeping way off in the servant's wing, if during the night I'd hobbled with my crutch all the way to the general's room, and I still don't know where that is, isn't it likely in all that time from my room to his and back someone would have seen me? Someone probably did. But right now they're not coming forward. Maybe they hated the general also, and you did their job for them. Uh, on one foot and one crutch. You believe that? I believe a man of your will, who can survive death and imprisonment, can do almost anything he wants to, Major. So my word means nothing to you. What are you going to do? I've sent for some irons for your hands and feet. You're going to put irons on one crutch and my one good foot? You knew he was dead before I saw you, Mrs. Cutler. My maid came and told me, Timothy. You're a very brave woman. You become very acquainted with death when you're married to a soldier. Let's keep walking, Timothy. Mrs. Cutler... Are you sure you feel like walking the grounds just now? I feel if I don't keep moving, I shall die. All of us in Washington love the general. He'll be missed. Yes, all of us. We'll miss him. I'm going to get to the bottom of this, I promise you. It's the last thing I do. I can't tell you how desperate I feel over this tragedy. When I was assigned to the general, it was such an honor... The department trusted me to protect him. Timothy, don't blame yourself. Now, who else is there to blame? What has Major Russell said? Uh, he denies everything. Says he was asleep. Isn't that possible? How can he prove it, Mrs. Cutler? What angers me as much as shames me is the story the Major gave as reason for his hatred for your husband. The more I go over it in my mind, sending rafts with 1,500 men, knowing the rebels must be lying in wait, the more I realize it's a wicked, wicked lie. No, Timothy. It wasn't. Calvin Russell's story of what happened was not a lie. It was the truth? Yes. Every word. <laughs> Mr. Forrest, how long am I going to be kept under restraint? I've sent for the Attorney General. He'll decide. Did you grant me my request? Yes, I did. Oh, that must be her. Come in, Mrs. Cutler. What? What have you done to him? He's in irons, Mrs. Cutler. Oh, no, that is horrible. It's horrible. Timothy, you must undo those irons immediately. I'm sorry, but I cannot. I must wait for the Attorney General and the Prosecutor of the Military Court. We are treating him worse than the Southerners did in Andersonville. No one was hobbled like this. I can't bear it. I won't have it. I'm truly sorry, Mrs. Cutler, but the Major is the only suspect we have at the moment. I can't have a human being treated this way. Major... I'm going to take steps this very moment so that these terrible things are removed and you are set free. Well, how do you aim to do that? I'm going to show you who killed my husband. You know that? I have known it since the night he died. It's there, Timothy. There at the bottom of Benjamin's lily pond. If you take a stick and move some of those water lilies, I'm sure you'll see it. What will I see? The gun that killed him. You saw the murderer throw it down there? I threw the gun into the pond. Yes, it's so. 
That night, in spite of the thunder, I... I heard the shot. I ran to his room. He had killed himself. On the desk was a note. It's down there also. I threw it into the pond. What did it say? That he knew he gave the wrong command. And since that day, he had been haunted by every death of every man. He couldn't live any longer with the shame of it. And asked me to forgive him. What could I do? I wanted so, even in death, to protect Benjamin. It never occurred to me the Major might be accused of his death, so I took what Ben had written and pulled the pistol from his hand and threw them down there in the lily pond. So now, will you remove the irons from that brave man? said before, this slightly tarnished piece of Americana is a tale of the brave and the mistakes and tragedies that followed. Here at the Mystery Theater, we have condensed many of the events as well as changed the names of the actual participants. Otherwise, it is what it is, a rather battered and torn page of American history. I shall return shortly. If you've been reading about wise money management in your favorite publications, you've undoubtedly heard about Dreyfus Liquid Assets, one of the world's largest money market funds, and about the big yields you can get on your money right now. Start with as little as $2,500. Make added investments as low as $100. With Dreyfus Liquid Assets, your money is yours whenever you need it. Phone for it, have it sent to your bank, or write a redemption check for cash or to pay your larger bills. You keep right on earning that high yield compounded daily until your check clears. No penalties on interest, no sales charge, no charge for the checks. It's so simple, sensible, convenient. But find out for yourself. Call toll-free 800-228-5000 for free information and a prospectus, including management fee, charges, and expenses. Read the prospectus carefully before investing or sending money. Discover how Dreyfus Liquid Assets can help you get the lion's share of today's high money market rates. 800-228-5000. Toll-free 800-228-5000. Socrates said it so very much better than anything I could devise. So permit me to speak his words. The long, unmeasured pulse of time moves everything. There is nothing hidden that it cannot bring to light. Nothing unknown that may not become known. The history of the great events of this world is little more than the history of crimes. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Keir DeLay, Bob Caliban, and Terry Keane. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. We mean, Norfolk. You know what I haven't had the nerve to say to me? Henry, calm yourself. Oh, to put it mildly, le majeste, huh? <laughs> I made that woman, and I can break her. I was forced to marry her. You would have me believe that? Yes, yes, her sorcery bewitched me, but it's all over. Over and done with. It's because of young Jane Seymour, isn't it? Well, might be. She's a charming creature. I won't be punished if I marry her, I can assure you of that. 
Your Majesty, who has punished you? Who would dare? Ah, for a wise man, you talk like a fool. A man is denied a son. Is that not the Lord's displeasure and anger? Well, I shall marry up there.